conquer South Korea. Russian controlled North Koreans with typical red disregard for international decency invading their fellow countrymen to the south. That was the official script, but we know today that it was the other way around. It was Kim Il-sung who asked Stalin. Stalin didn't like this idea at first because he didn't want to provoke the Americans. He didn't want to trigger World War III over Korea, which was not that important to him compared to Europe. Eventually, Kim convinced Stalin that they could get away with this. Kim predicts that the conquest of South Korea will take only 30 days. The war drags on for more than three years. The tragedy is still vivid in my mind. I was 15 at the time. It was frightening. All houses burnt down, rubble, block after block, burning, starvation. Everybody living in sheds. When I think of those days, I shrivel, I tremble. When the ceasefire is finally declared in 1953, North Korea has gained nothing. The original border at the 38th parallel is restored. The country is still split in two. Nearly 400,000 South Koreans have died, 37,000 Americans. North Korea and its ally China have lost 1,400,000. The Soviet Union has suffered virtually no casualties. Kim was clearly disappointed at the low level of real military backing that he got from Stalin, and that created a, a level of mistrust that he, he never completely uh, overcame. This sense of mistrust and betrayal reinforces Kim Il-sung's philosophy of self-reliance at all costs. It will guide his actions and those of his son and successor, Kim Jong-il, for years to come. Beneath the smiles of Kim Il-sung and the leader of communist China, Mao Zedong, by the 1960s, tensions are brewing. The Chinese wage what they call the Great Cultural Revolution in China. And they come to Korea and they tell Kim Il-sung that you are a bad communist. You look too fat. And you have so many palaces uh, in the different resort areas. And uh, how can a uh, very frugal communist act in that fashion? Kim Il-sung don't stand for this and, and kick them out and recalls the ambassador from China and tell Chinese ambassador to go home. Nobody could tell North Korea what to do. This is the environment in which Kim Il-sung's oldest son, Kim Jong-il, begins his rise to power. His rapid ascension through the ranks culminates in 1980. Kim Il-sung, known to all as great leader, officially designates Kim Jong-il as successor. He is now to be known as dear leader. Suddenly, this myth appears that Kim Jong-il was born on sacred Mount Pektu, a mythical place where the Korean people supposedly originated in the far distant past, and that at the time of his birth, in the middle of February, flowers bloomed, there was a double rainbow in the sky, and the whole world knew that a great new leader had been born. In reality, Kim Jong-il is born in a Russian military camp in the Soviet Union on February 16, 1942. At the end of World War II, he moves with his family to Pyongyang, the new capital of North Korea. Little is known about Kim Jong-il's early life. His first job, at age 22, is in the propaganda section of the party. He made propaganda films. He made musicals. He staged plays. So he's naturally get involved with the actresses. 
He's uh, been called a playboy, and he likes the women, and he likes to drink, and and all the uh, what artists enjoy that he he really enjoys. He particularly likes certain genres of films, such as uh, horror films, including the Friday the Thirteenth series, uh, Elizabeth Taylor films, uh, and um, westerns. At some stage. He decided that the actresses and actors in North Korea were not very good. And so he said, "I would like to have uh, uh, Miss Che, who is one of the more noted actresses in South Korea, here to make movies." And so they kidnapped her. In 1978, Che Yun Hee is kidnapped by North Korean agents. When she arrives in North Korea, she is greeted by the dear leader himself. There was a voice. Welcome to North Korea. I am Kim Jong Il. I felt I was now to be killed. I felt as if all my blood fell down to my feet. Six months later, Miss Che's husband, the renowned film director Shin Sung Ok, is also kidnapped. Over the next three years, they are forced to make films for Kim Jong Il, including a North Korean version of Godzilla. We had money and all kinds of conveniences, but we didn't have freedom. I was 60 then; I couldn't die there. Shin and Che eventually escape, but the practice of kidnapping becomes an integral part of Kim's strategy for destabilizing his enemies. Between 1977 and 1983, several Japanese citizens vanish without a trace. The North Koreans said we needed Japanese role models so that we could learn from them how to behave like Japanese and how to sound like Japanese when we spoke. The purpose is for North Korean agents to pose as Japanese, thus providing cover and deniability while engaging in acts of sabotage against South Korea. By the mid-1980s, South Korea is the model of a modern capitalist nation. Its booming economy is a constant source of resentment to Kim, whose own economy is on the brink of disaster. Adding insult to injury, Seoul is internationally recognized as a world-class city when it is designated as host of the 1988 Olympics. Determined to intimidate participants and disrupt the games, North Korea turns to its strategy of abduction and sabotage to perpetrate an act of terrorism, allegedly at the direction of Kim Jong-il. In 1987, two North Korean agents posing as Japanese tourists plant a bomb on board a Korean Airlines flight headed to Seoul. Soon after they deplane at a stopover, the bomb explodes. <laughs> killing 115 people. <laughs> the capture of 25-year-old Kim Hyun-hee is a sensation. When asked why she did it, Kim Hyun-hee claims that she was brainwashed from early childhood to worship and obey the great and dear leaders of North Korea. To many, this sounds far-fetched. But to those who have experienced North Korea's system of indoctrination, it has the ring of truth. In kindergarten, we start learning about Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung's birthdays. On those days, they give candies and other gifts, and there are portraits of them. And then we bow in front of them and say, Thank you, General Kim Il-sung. And then we take the gifts. As I grew up, we learned that the U.S. is the American imperialist wolf. We were taught that American missionaries came to Korea, and they committed all kinds of barbarous acts. And so if somebody stole an apple, then the missionaries caught the child and then burned on his forehead the word thief with acid. So people in North Korea think Americans are cannibals. And young children, when they learn this stuff, they think it's real history. 
I didn't know anything about the outside world. I thought North Korea was the best place in the whole world, a paradise. If you are brainwashed into thinking that you are living in the world's best country and you have no alternative sources of information, then it is much more possible for the dictator to control you. What Kim Jong-il fears most is his people getting to know the outside world. As people get to know about the outside world, he will come crashing down. As the 1980s end, the Soviet empire begins to crumble. Communist regimes throughout Eastern Europe are toppled. The Berlin Wall is torn down. And finally, the USSR dissolves. Yet North Korea seems impervious to this turning of the tide. In fact, Kim Il-sung uses the collapse of communism elsewhere to further rally support for his ideology of independence. The North Koreans did not see Kim Il-sung as repressive. He was always held up as the heroic leader who was fending off these evil influences from outside and that only by supporting him fully could the North Koreans win full independence. Increasingly isolated in an ever more hostile world, Kim Jong-il, now head of the military, looks for options to ensure the security of his father's regime. He turns to a nuclear weapons program begun in the early 1980s. Despite Kim's denials, U.S. intelligence has confirmed its existence. It will soon lead North Korea to the brink of a full-scale war with the United States. On the morning of June 16, 1994, President Bill Clinton calls together his top advisors for what amounts to a war council. Plans for the deployment of a massive military force to South Korea are on the table. Satellite photos have revealed compelling evidence that North Korea is attempting to build a nuclear bomb. We were preparing for the possibility of war in a very serious way, planning, first of all, for a strike on the nuclear complex but secondly, for the war that could well have resulted had the North Koreans launched an invasion of South Korea. That all looked very, very real to us uh, at the time. The Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 is the most dangerous moment the world has, has seen. I think 1994 uh, is the second. In fact, the Secretary of Defense Perry was briefing President Clinton in the Oval Office on a reinforcement plan at the very moment that former President Carter, Jimmy Carter, called President Clinton from Pyongyang and said, hold on, I've been talking to Kim Il-sung and maybe there's some negotiated agreement that could be reached. This President CNN Carter has gone to Pyongyang to try to negotiate a diplomatic solution to the crisis. It is now past midnight, Friday morning in North Korea. And he appears on CNN to announce his achievement. President Kim Il-sung has uh, committed himself to... Carter saved Clinton's bacon because the Clinton administration had the idea that pressure is the only way you can deal with a problem like this. They had no understanding of North Korean psychology, uh, which is uh, that that simply made them more determined to resist uh, the pressure and show that they would not be cowed down by the mighty superpower. Carter has averted a military showdown. In exchange for oil and other sources of energy and the eventual normalization of relations with the United States, the North Koreans agree to freeze their nuclear program. But while the terms of the agreement are being negotiated, an unexpected event rocks North Korea. Kim Il-sung suddenly dies of a heart attack. The shock is felt even by those aware of his abuses who have escaped to the south. When Kim Il-sung died, I wept. I really mourned. 
He couldn't believe it. He seemed immortal. Many died from excessive